spectator. Welcome everyone. Happy Cardinals opening day. I'm Janet Gillow, Director of Professional Development with the Brown School, Washington University in St. Louis. Welcome to our open classroom program. I want to thank and acknowledge my friend and colleague, Cynthia Williams, who's our Assistant Dean of Community Partnerships and my co-host for this program. For our participants joining on Zoom throughout this program, you are muted. We can't see or hear you, but many of you have already joined the conversation, checked in by chat, and we love that. So please keep it coming as the program goes. Uh, send in your comments, your questions, and then we'll bring you into the conversation um, as, as the program ends. For folks joining on YouTube, we are delighted you're with us, and we don't have a way to directly um, interact with you through the program. Before we get started today, I just want to let you know some of the things that we have coming up. So next week on Tuesday, Panina Akayo Laker is going to be delivering a program for us on interdisciplinary and human-centered design. Uh, that's in partnership with our friends at the International Center for Child Health and Development. On Wednesday the 14th, Professor Derek Brown is going to be with us offering an introduction to economic analysis for policy. And that's made possible by the Social Policy Institute at Washington University. And then I also want to flag for your attention a brand new event that we just added for Monday the 19th. Professor Tim McBride um, is presenting on the long and winding path to Medicaid ex expansion in Missouri. Are we there yet? For folks that uh, have been watching that, uh, we approved a constitutional amendment back in August and it has yet to be funded. Um, so if healthcare expansion is of interest to you, healthcare access, um, Tim is going to share with us the latest and, and sort of strategies moving forward. I'll throw a link in the chat in just a minute if you'd like to sign up for some of those programs. Um, but now I'm gonna pivot my attention to introducing today's speaker who is just absolutely an open classroom favorite. Dr. Megan Keyes is a clinical psychologist who specializes in the assessment and evidence-based treatment of PTSD. She has more than 20 years experience in the trauma field. She's adjunct faculty at the Brown School and also founder of Trauma Empowered Consulting, which provides education and consulting services to organizations and professionals who work with trauma survivors. She's a frequent instructor in our professional development series, and she's also one of the leaders of our postmaster certificate in assessment and treatment of PTSD in adults. And if that's of interest to you, we are still um, accepting applications for our fall co cohort. So I'll share a link about that as well. Um, but without further ado, please welcome my friend, Megan. Well, thank you so much, Janet, and thank you, Cynthia. It is great to be back. Um, hello, everyone. Welcome to Open Classroom, and thank you for joining us. I am looking forward to sharing this material with you on a pretty timely topic, burnout and compassion fatigue during COVID-19. After, um, after reviewing the various resources in terms of what can potentially contribute to burnout and compassion fatigue and what those symptoms may look like, the goal really is to help give you a chance to focus on what you can do about it. So we then will switch and focus on various adaptive coping strategies for building resilience to help mitigate these issues. So these are the different points that we'll be covering today, just to give you a sense of the content. Again, my whole goal was really to provide you information that would be both helpful and hopeful. So the first half will really be more informational about these various issues. The second half will be more solution focused. Please just note that the strategies and skills discussed today are not intended to substitute formal mental health treatment should such service be warranted. The information is being provided as self-help tools for your own use as ways to reduce stress and enhance your emotional well-being. All right, so I'd like to begin with just a brief polling question. So my goal really was just to get a sense of how everyone on today has been impacted by the pandemic in terms of your work and your work life. So for anyone who would like to participate, please feel free to select whichever response best describes the way that you've been most impacted by COVID-19. And it will just take us a few moments for these results to be tallied. But just so that you're aware, the various responses that I listed for this polling question are several of the most common work-related stressors that professionals have reported as a result of the pandemic. And we will be touching on those in a bit more detail in just a short while. Give them 10 more seconds to reply. Oh, 
Okay, and so it does look like we said the vast majority of individuals have really just experienced a lot of the increased stress related to the range of professional issues they've encountered as a result of the pandemic. It also looks like struggling with that work-life balance and the potential risk of contracting the virus have been other significant stressors. So again, I just want to highlight, regardless of what response you endorsed, please know that you're not alone, since these are several of the most common work-related stressors. And again, part of our discussion of resilience today is going to be highlighting strategies that can help you develop better coping abilities for dealing with these various stressors. All right, let me shut down the poll and we'll come back to our slides. There we go. All right, so for our purposes today, we'll be discussing burnout and compassion fatigue within the context of one's profession. Burnout and compassion fatigue are not medical conditions or clinical diagnoses. They are considered reactions to chronic work-related stress. Burnout may occur within most any profession, while compassion fatigue is typically associated with helping professions, such as healthcare, social service, or mental health providers. However, it's important to note that compassion fatigue and burnout may both occur at a personal level as well. Individuals may experience bur bur symptoms of burnout associated with chronic personal stressors, and research has indicated that individuals who serve as primary caregivers, such as for family members who are chronically ill or elderly, may experience symptoms of compassion fatigue. All right, in the most basic terms, burnout is the exhaustion one experiences when overwhelmed by work. It has a gradual onset as a result of that prolonged work-related stress. Most people have a somewhat intuitive sense of burnout, even if they don't necessarily attribute it to their job as the primary cause. Burnout may negatively impact an individual's physical and mental health, as well as their job performance. Research indicates that burnout has been associated with sleep difficulties, hypertension, and coronary heart disease, as well as anxiety, depression, and increased substance use. Exhaustion is the central feature of burnout, and this simply refers to those feelings of fatigue, low energy, being bogged down or drained by the work. Cynicism is also sometimes referred to as depersonalization. This particular feature of burnout refers to mentally or emotionally distancing oneself from their job. So you may feel detached or disconnected from your work or your professional identity. You may notice a lack of emotion or a sense of numbness about your work as well. Inefficacy centers around feelings of incompetence, concerns about lack of achievement or reduced productivity. When struggling with burnout, many professionals experience difficulty coping with the demands of their job, as well as decreased job performance. In more severe cases, burnout may result in a sense of hopelessness regarding your professional efforts, including the belief that your contributions are inconsequential or meaningless. Although these are the primary features of burnout, additional symptoms can include feelings of unhappiness, irritability, and difficulty concentrating. There are a range of factors that contribute to burnout. First and foremost is excessive workload, simply having too much to do. An unsupportive work environment may pertain to leadership as well as peers. Examples include a supervisor who micromanages you or colleagues who attempt to undermine you, a perceived lack of respect or fairness within your team, as well as conflictual or dysfunctional dynamics within your workplace. Any of these interpersonal issues can increase work-related stress. Insufficient resources includes not having the necessary time, skills, information, or support to adequately perform your duties, all of which may contribute to exhaustion. Unclear job expectations refers to a lack of clarity regarding the degree of authority or autonomy that you have, as well as what your supervisor or coworkers expect from you. A lack of feedback and recognition may also result in you feeling uncertain about the quality of your work, which can enhance a sense of inefficacy. 
Lack of control involves the inability to participate in decisions that directly impact your job, including your designated tasks or assignments, workload, and schedule. This may result one in someone feeling as if they can't or won't be able to achieve certain goals or succeed in certain situations. And finally, difficulty maintaining balance between your professional life and your personal life, namely that the vast majority of your time, efforts, and energy are spent on work may contribute to burnout as well. So now turning our attention to compassion fatigue. Compassion fatigue is defined as the emotional strain or exhaustion of working with individuals who've experienced trauma or adversity. The strain is due in part to the demands of being empathic and helpful to those who are suffering. Individuals who are experiencing emotional pain or distress as a result of these stressful life events and circumstances. Compassion fatigue is often referred to as the cost of caring, a term coined by Charles Figley, one of the pioneers in this field. One of the challenges of understanding the literature in this area is the terminology. Compassion fatigue, burnout, secondary traumatic stress, and vicarious traumatization are overlapping concepts, but often used interchangeably despite their differences. The, common, the central commonality is that these terms all describe the emotional impact professionals may experience when working with those who've experienced significantly stressful life events. However, research has also identified positive aspects of working with such populations. Some of the positive effects reported by service providers include being inspired by their clients, gaining new perspectives regarding personal challenges or priorities, and feeling more hopeful. The model of compassion fatigue I'd like to share with you today is called the Professional Quality of Life Model, developed by the psychologist Dr. Beth Stamm. This is a widely recognized model in the field, and it's a basis of a common self-report measure used to assess compassion fatigue. Professional quality of life is essentially how a person feels about their work as a helper and is influenced by both positive and negative aspects of the job. The two key components are compassion satisfaction and compassion fatigue, with compassion fatigue being a result of burnout as well as secondary traumatic stress. So since we've already reviewed burnout, I'd just like to walk you through these additional variables. Compassion satisfaction refers to the feelings of pleasure and satisfaction one derives from the ability to do your work well. These positive feelings can stem from the helping itself, as well as other sources, such as positive relations with your colleagues, or the sense that you're able to contribute to your profession or the greater good of society in a meaningful way. Common characteristics of compassion satisfaction include liking the work that you're doing and wanting to continue doing it, feeling happy and invigorated by your work, feeling successful, and believing that you can make a difference. This is an important concept to be aware of because compassion satisfaction has been found to serve as a protective factor against compassion against secondary traumatic stress, which lowers the risk of compassion fatigue. Secondary traumatic stress refers to the stress reactions a person experiences from indirect trauma exposure, namely working with individuals who have experienced traumatic or significantly stressful life events. Secondary traumatic stress may have a gradual onset like burnout, but it also may have a rapid onset when it's associated with a specific event, such as a particular client or case. Research tells us that secondary traumatic stress may negatively impact a person in a range of ways, including changes to one's emotional, cognitive, behavioral, and interpersonal functioning. When we think of professionals at risk of secondary traumatic stress, certain occupations may immediately come to mind, such as therapists working with trauma survivors, or healthcare workers serving injured individuals who were critically injured or terminally ill. 
Research over the years has shown that there are a range of professions in which one may experience symptoms of secondary traumatic stress. And I'm primarily highlighting this just to broaden everyone's perspective about STS and who may be at risk of being impacted through their work. The key symptoms of secondary traumatic stress are very similar to the symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder or PTSD. Secondary traumatic stress essentially involves experiencing the traumatic stress or extreme stress of someone else as your own. Re-experiencing symptoms involve intrusive thoughts or images of your client's trauma or adversity that may elicit negative emotions such as anxiety or a sense of helplessness. If you are working with a client who experienced child abuse, you may find yourself having unwanted thoughts or images of their abuse when interacting with your own children. Avoidance involves avoiding or escaping stimuli that remind you of your client's trauma in some way. So this could include quickly skimming over documentation of their abuse or illness, such as police or medical reports or graphic images. This may have you include avoidance of the client themselves. You may find yourself trying to limit direct contact with the person, preferring instead to conduct business via phone or email. And finally, increased arousal embodies a range of symptoms, including feeling on edge or on guard, being jumpy or easily startled, sleep difficulties, irritability, and problems concentrating. Although these are the three key features of secondary traumatic stress, additional symptoms can include low mood, social withdrawal or isolation, and feeling emotionally numb or detached. So there are three key factors that may contribute to secondary traumatic stress, all of which center around different sources of stress. The first is simply your degree of exposure to indirect trauma. Namely, how much are you coming in contact with the upsetting details or extreme stress of those clients that you're serving? So this includes the frequency and duration of exposure, as well as the means of exposure. So you may have direct contact with the person, such as hearing a detailed account of their experience or witnessing their emotional distress or you may have indirect contact, such as reviewing records or documentation about their adverse experiences. Individuals who have personally experienced trauma may be at increased risk of secondary traumatic stress. Indirect exposure to the traumatic stress of clients may result in unwanted thoughts or images of your own trauma and may cause some level of emotional distress, including feelings of anxiety or depression. And finally, current life stressors can contribute to secondary traumatic stress. None of us work or practice in a bubble. Life goes on regardless of what type of work-related stressors we may be dealing with. Other life demands that require your attention and time and efforts can make it more difficult to effectively cope with those professional stressors. So an excellent example of a current life stressor would be living through a year-long global pandemic, which we will be reviewing in more detail in just a moment. So when we combine our various features of burnout and secondary traumatic stress, as well as their associated symptoms, we have a picture of how compassion fatigue may, may present. Now, my goal was to give you a very comprehensive summary of the various signs of compassion fatigue so that you have a better ability to recognize any potential indicators. Several of these symptoms are not unique to compassion fatigue. Other stressors or health issues may certainly result in these changes. However, in the absence of other readily identified stressors, if you are experiencing some of these symptoms, it could be helpful to evaluate if compassion fatigue may be contributing. All right, so now circling back to other life stressors, I want to touch on pandemic-related stress and how this may play a role in contributing to burnout or compassion fatigue. The handful of studies to date on burnout and compassion fatigue in the context of COVID-19 have primarily focused on healthcare workers, namely our frontline nurses and physicians. 
However, a good deal of survey-based data has been published over the past year that certainly speaks to the mental health impact of COVID-19 on the general public. When we consider the pandemic as a stressor, Research indicates that most everyone has been impacted in some way. So I'd like to highlight two online resources that anyone can access that provide ongoing data regarding this impact. The American Psychological Association conducts an ongoing survey called Stress in America that examines the impact of various stressors on our nation. The most recent results were just published in March. In a survey of approximately 3,000 US adults, many reported declining physical health due to difficulty coping with the ongoing stress of the pandemic. Approximately 60% reported undesired weight changes since the onset of COVID-19. For those who imported, reported increased weight, the average weight gain was about 15 pounds. Nearly 25% reported consuming more alcohol than prior to the pandemic as a means of coping with stress. And roughly two out of three respondents continue to report sleep difficulties, namely sleeping more or less than desired. When considering mental health effects, research indicates that the most common changes reported are symptoms of anxiety and depression. The Census Bureau has conducted an ongoing survey since the onset of COVID-19 called the Household Pulse Survey. So the most recent results were published online in mid-March and indicated that of the approximately 70,000 U.S. adults surveyed, 37% reported symptoms of anxiety and depression in the past week. So I share this information first and foremost, just to validate and normalize what many people may have experienced or may currently be experiencing. Even in the context of our vaccine rollout and society reopening, the chronic stress many have experienced over the past year is still impacting people in very real ways, which can make coping with other stressors that much more difficult. As noted, symptoms of burnout may occur due to personal stressors, and personal stressors can increase one's risk of secondary traumatic stress, which can contribute to compassion fatigue. The pandemic has also resulted in new work-related stressors that many have had to navigate, and these are essentially the response options that I gave you on our initial polling question. For those who are essential workers or unable to work remotely, fear of possible exposure to the virus may well be an ongoing source of stress. Depending on your occupation, you may experience uncertainty regarding the future of your job or possible unemployment. For many, working remotely has involved making many adjustments to how and when you conduct your work. Challenges associated with working remotely include learning new technology, managing ongoing technical issues, and maintaining boundaries between your workday and personal time when working from home. Many have experienced increased caregiving duties for high-risk family members, remote schooling, quarantines due to potential exposure, and caring for family members who were infected are additional responsibilities many professionals have had to manage in the context of full-time jobs. And finally, it's important to remember that both you and your clients are sharing this experience of living through a pandemic, and you both are likely being impacted by some of the same stressors, such as fear of infection, social distancing, and safety restrictions. Exposure to the negative impact of these stressors on your clients, as well as hearing their anxiety and fears about these issues, may well exacerbate your own concerns and distress. So, in the context of burnout and compassion fatigue, pandemic-related stress can potentially increase one's work-related stress in a variety of ways. All right, that concludes the first part of our webinar. So I just wanna pause for a moment to address any questions that may have come up before we progress forward. Hi, Megan, there's one question. Mm -hmm. Can compassion fatigue and or burnout be prevented? 
Yes, yeah, so there are a lot of suggestions and that's part of what our second half is going to focus on, on different skills that you can use to kind of mitigate these issues, either to help build up resilience to prevent them, or if you are experiencing some symptoms or signs of them, things that you can do to help reduce those. So that will be the, set, the focus of our second half. Okay. And I will reserve the additional questions until then because they're related to overcoming and prevention. Okay, perfect. Well, we will move forward. Okay. All right. So now we're going to shift gears into the more solution focused part of today's webinar. Of all the content that I cover today, if there's one take home point that I hope everyone walks away with, it is the information on this slide. Whenever we discuss stress or trauma, it's so important that we also discuss resilience. Research tells us that the most common response to trauma, adversity, and stress is resilience and recovery. Although most people may experience some negative reactions to stressors, personal or professional, these reactions are typically time limited. The vast majority of individuals naturally recover from these stressors on their own and resilience plays a role in that recovery. Resilience is defined as the process of adapting well to difficult situations. It isn't a trait that we're born with or without, but a set of skills that we can learn and strengthen over time by our choices, behaviors, and ways of thinking. Cultivating resilience is important because it serves as a protective factor against anxiety and depression, and it improves our coping abilities. Now, there are a wide range of adaptive coping skills. I selected four key strategies that are often recommended for building resilience against burnout or compassion fatigue, but several of which that also can be especially useful for coping with pandemic-related stress. The more you build your resilience, the better you'll be able to adapt to difficult situations, period. So my goal is to provide you with practical, concrete suggestions for cultivating resilience that can benefit you in managing work-related stress, pandemic-related stress, or personal stress. All right, so our first strategy involves developing the ability to recognize potential signs of burnout or compassion fatigue. Thus, engaging in regular self-evaluation is recommended. So this may be informal such as doing a self-check-in once a week or every few weeks, just to determine if you're experiencing any of those potential symptoms. It may also be a formal assessment using a self-report measure, such as the professional quality of life scale. So the model we reviewed is the basis of this measure. It's been found to be a valid measure and is currently in its fifth edition. This is simply a 30 item self-report measure that takes about 10 minutes to complete it can be downloaded free of cost from the website listed. Upon completion, you'll derive scores on those three subscales that are listed, which includes an indicator of burnout. And you'll be able to determine if those scores fall in the low average or high range. You're also able to download the manual from this website, which provides further explanation of how to interpret your scores. The important thing to remember is that burnout and compassion and fatigue are not clinical diagnoses. So a high score on one of these scales does not necessarily mean there is a definitive problem, but it does indicate that you're at increased risk. So if you are experiencing symptoms of burnout or compassion fatigue, consider examining what aspects of your work may be contributing at this time. And if there are any modifications that can be made in your professional life that may be helpful. If the scores are particularly concerning to you, you can always consider discussing these professional issues with a supervisor, colleague, or healthcare professional. Our second strategy focuses on enhancing social support. Research tells us that strong social support can improve resilience against stress. With regards to enhancing social support in the workplace, this can include leadership as well as coworkers. Seeking guidance from a supervisor may involve discussing how burnout or compassion fatigue is impacting you in your work. You may consider 
collaborative problem solving to determine possible strategies that could be helpful. These strategies may pertain to factors such as your workload, deadlines, additional support, or additional training if needed. Also, developing a plan for regular check-ins to monitor progress is recommended. In terms of social support among colleagues, some professionals opt to establish a formal peer supervision group that meets on a regular basis to discuss professional challenges. You may also consider informal check-ins as a means of simply helping each other track work-related stress. The key with either of these approaches is to use that peer connection to discuss how people are dealing with stress, what's working and what's helpful and what isn't. The process of learning that others likely share similar struggles can be really helpful in you realizing that you're not alone. In terms of enhancing social support in the personal realm, regular interpersonal contact is key. Engage with others on a consistent basis, even if the only option may still be virtual a portion of the time. Regularly connect with other people by whatever means you have available, be it in person or via phone, video, or online. Be strategic and try to connect with people who can provide you what you might need in a given moment. The family member who's the good listener, the friend with the great sense of humor who always cheers you up. Consider sharing negative experiences with someone you trust. People need to talk to people, especially when going through stressful or negative experiences. Research indicates that the avoidance of talking about it and keeping those feelings bottled up often leads to more negative health outcomes down the line. And finally, be willing to accept support from others and considering offering support to others if you're able. Research tells us that giving support increases positive emotions and reduces negative emotions. All right. Our thoughts or perceptions of any given situation have a huge impact on our feelings. Given the various challenges associated with any profession, as well as the additional challenges due to the pandemic, it's understandable that many are going to experience feelings of anxiety, sadness, and anger at times. These are natural emotional responses to sometimes very difficult situations. However, the intensity of our feelings can be exacerbated by our thoughts. If you notice at times certain emotions feel very powerful, overwhelming, maybe even disruptive to what you're doing, that can be a good indication to check in on your thinking. When our thoughts gravitate towards extremes or absolutes, using words such as always, never, should, that tends to be unhelpful as extreme thoughts typically result in extreme emotions. Replacing those unhelpful thoughts with thinking that is more balanced and accurate can not only reduce the intensity of negative emotions, but allow for the possibility of positive emotions as well. So in the context of chronic work-related stress or pandemic-related stress, Many may find themselves struggling with issues related to control and expectations. So a very common unhelpful thought many may experience is, I have no control over anything, which understandably could result in a person feeling anxious, scared, or helpless. Replacing that thought with one that's just a bit more balanced, I have control over some things and I'm going to focus on those, may not only result in you feeling less anxious, but may also allow you to feel a bit more capable or hopeful. Finding ways to maintain hope during stressful or difficult times is important. Keeping a hopeful or optimistic perspective can be reassuring because it sustains the expectation that things will eventually improve and get better. Hi. And finally, our fourth key strategy centers around self-care. So self-care is a term that has definitely become part of our mainstream culture, and it is portrayed in a wide variety of ways. 
So for some individuals, self-care may involve a hot bath with scented candles and, and soothing music. For others, self-care may involve binging a favorite Netflix series and eating tacos. And for many, self-care could involve both of those activities. The bottom line is self-care is being proactive in protecting and supporting your well-being physically, emotionally, mentally, and spiritually. So self-care may look a bit different for everyone, but research has indicated that there are some core components of self-care that are particularly helpful when dealing with stress. Being intentional and consistently protecting time for self-care in your daily or weekly routine helps establish a process of work-life balance, which for many professionals is used as a way to reduce stress. So in terms of practicing wellness, good nutrition, adequate sleep and regular exercise help maintain physical health and protect against the negative impact of stress. Remember those results from the APA survey. A year into this pandemic, people are now noticing their physical health declining due to that ongoing stress. So for example, research indicates that regular exercise reduces symptoms of anxiety and depression for some people and promotes better sleep. Our physical health and mental health influence each other. So maintaining one helps maintain the other. Participating in hobbies and recreation supports good mental health. Research indicates individuals who regularly engage in enjoyable activities report lower levels of stress and enhanced positive mood. Although some activities may not yet be feasible due to the pandemic, carving out time to regularly dedicate yourself to some pleasurable activities can help reduce stress. Using time management skills and establishing clear boundaries between your professional and personal life help maintain balance. Now, understandably, this may feel like a bit of a moving target at times, but to whatever degree you can maintain some established boundaries, such as no cell phones during meals, or no work calls or emails at least one day out of the weekend, helps preserve that process of work-life balance. Try to be proactive in reducing stress by utilizing coping skills, such as relaxation techniques, meditation, or mindfulness. Research shows that these techniques are very effective for decreasing stress and anxiety in the moment, as well as over time. Individuals who regularly practice these techniques and incorporate them into their daily routine tend to report lower overall levels of stress. And I'll be touching on some specific options here when we review resources. And finally, part of adaptive coping involves recognizing when professional assistance may be warranted. So please consider seeking such services if needed. Right. And just to expand on that last point, determining if professional assistance is needed often raises the question of how do I know? So here are some potential indicators to keep in mind regarding whatever changes or symptoms you may be experiencing. So if these symptoms become excessive, they are occurring more often than not for an extended period of time, such as one to two months. If these changes are distressing, they feel out of control or unmanageable. They're becoming a source of conflict in your relationship. If the symptoms are impairing your functioning, so these symptoms are starting to interfere or prevent you from doing what you need to do or you wanna do. And finally, if any of these changes involve safety concerns, thoughts of hurting yourself or others, frequent thoughts of death, even vague better off dead feelings. These are all indications that professional assistance may be helpful, at least to determine what's going on and get a better sense of what's impacting you and how. Regarding treatment, especially if you're considering psychotherapy, please be aware there are many time-limited evidence-based treatments for issues such as depression, anxiety, and insomnia. When searching for a therapist, this resource from Psychology Today is very user-friendly. It allows you to search a range of mental health clinicians, including psychiatrists, based on the type of provider you're seeking and your location.
And finally, I always want to ensure everyone has access to a crisis line if needed. The National Suicide Prevention Lifeline is a 24-7 confidential resource for individuals in crisis or with a loved one in crisis. Their website also provides a wide range of resources. I would encourage you to consider adding this phone number to the contact list in your phone just to ensure that you have it at your fingertips should you ever need or want it for yourself or someone else. All right, and finally, just in case we have management or leadership joining us today, I want to highlight a few specific suggestions how, on how to best support staff in mitigating burnout and compassion fatigue. First, it's important to not just encourage work-life balance, but also serve as a role model. If you are regularly staying after hours, working weekends, and not utilizing any of your vacation days, it may make it difficult for others to feel that they can or should maintain that balance. Since excessive workload is a key contributor to burnout, just try to be mindful in the distribution of workload to prevent any extreme demand on someone's caseload or schedule. Regularly reviewing or checking in with staff can be helpful in monitoring this issue. Anonymous employee satisfaction surveys may be useful as well. Promoting wellness, both personally and professionally, really helps reinforce wellness as a priority. Become familiar with various wellness resources, including if your company has a mental health policy or allows mental health days as part of a leave program. Ensuring these resources are readily available on the employee website or via regular email reminders helps enhance accessibility. Open and transparent communication is key, especially with regards to expectations and feedback. Lack of clarity regarding either of these can contribute to employee stress and possible feelings of inefficacy. And finally, encourage access to health and wellness practitioners as well as professional coaches if feasible. Maintain an up-to-date list of possible referral sources. And again, if feasible, consider having such professionals occasionally provide workshops to your staff that encourage the use of wellness techniques or address common professional challenges or work-related stressors. All right, so finally, just to review some potentially helpful resources. Headspace and Calm are both stress reduction apps that are primarily focused on meditation and mindfulness. Each app also includes a sleep program that involves various stories, sounds, and relaxation techniques to promote sleep. Their websites include published studies on the effectiveness or impact of the app in reducing stress. Headspace recently released a Netflix series called Headspace Guide to Meditation. It is composed of eight 20 minute episodes and each episode includes basic education and instruction, as well as a 10 minute guided meditation exercise. And at the end of April, they will be releasing another series called Headspace Guide to Sleep. COVID Coach is a free app developed by the VA's National Center for PTSD in response to the current pandemic. It is available in English and Spanish, and it works on both iOS and Android platforms. COVID Coach provides research-based techniques for a range of issues, including stress, sleep, anger, feelings of sadness, and relationship issues. It also includes guided exercises in relaxation techniques such as breathing, progressive muscle relaxation, and guided imagery. All right. With regards to managing pandemic-related stress, these are mental health resources for the general public. However, these sites also include sections for special populations, such as parents and caregivers, as well as managers and leadership. And finally, here are just a few additional burnout and compassion fatigue resources if interested. The first two resources focus on burnout in general, so they are not aimed towards any particular profession. That third resource is focused on health providers working with trauma survivors. However, I do believe that several of the self-care suggestions could benefit many other professionals. That site also directs you to a free one-hour webinar on this topic.
And finally, that fourth resource is a quick and easy read. It was developed for healthcare workers during the pandemic, but it provides many practical suggestions for reducing stress and compassion fatigue. All right, so that concludes our content. Um, I would like to go ahead and end with just another poll question to get a sense of what was most resonant for everyone. So of the various strategies that we were covered regarding building resilience, if you were to select one that you'd like to begin to implement starting this week or maybe even this afternoon, which one do you think would be most helpful to you? And again, we're just going to give a poll a minute or so to tally up the results. And then we're definitely going to open it up for questions and discussion. And I do want to just add to everyone, and I don't know if Janet may have already put this in the, the chat box, but all the references for today's talks, as well as the links to all the resources that I highlighted, are in a Word document just to make those easier to access and navigate. So those should be available as well as a PDF of all the slides. The resources in the chat, and we will put references and slides on our website. Um, the part of the Open Classroom webpage that has free resources on demand. We'll give people just about five more seconds to answer the poll question and then we'll share out the results. All right, so okay, it looks like again, practicing personal wellness may be the one that folks feel like would be the most helpful, very closely followed by social support and engaging in that work life balance. All right, excellent. Thank you, everyone. It's always just really nice to kind of get a sense of where these things land and what's resonant for people. So let me just go ahead. Like I said, we can now certainly go ahead and open it up for questions and discussion. Megan, thank you so much for the wealth of information, the resources and the tips, particularly for those who are in leadership. One question that comes from Rachel is, will you please summarize the difference between burnout and depression and anxiety? Certainly, so when we think of, when we think of burnout, Burnout, like I said, would be considered sort of a stress reaction specifically to kind of work-related stress. And the three key components of burnout are going to be that exhaustion, that cynicism, and that kind of sense of self-efficacy. Anxiety and depression would be, especially if we're talking about kind of formal mood disorders, again, could certainly result from work-related stress. So I'm not saying that that couldn't be possible, but each of those would involve kind of very specific set of symptoms um, that may last for a certain frequency and duration of time in order to determine if those are a kind of clinical diagnosis. Thank you for that. Um, so a question came in, um, many organizations are now contemplating, um, if not returning to life before, but workers that have been remote um, are going to be back in um, the office, whether it's the individual or the, themselves or somebody in a leadership role, change is not easy for people, right? Um, it can put them in a stress situation. And I'm curious what thoughts or comments you could offer on how to handle re-entry um, in, a, in a sensitive and supportive way for people? Well, that's a great question. And that's something I've actually been thinking about a lot, even, even as a potential topic for open classroom, because I think a lot of people are going to be dealing with this. Do it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So just, um, just based on kind of my familiarity with the literature and what we're seeing in terms of the ongoing mental health impact, I think Personally, I think one thing that's really important to keep in mind are expectations because our expectations and what we expect within certain situations or from certain individuals can really have a huge impact on our experience and our feelings. And I think it's important for people to realize that even though there are many positive things happening in terms of the vaccine rollout, schools reopening, getting to go back to the office, getting to be back around your colleagues and supervisors. The idea that it's just going to be simply flipping a switch and we're returning back to normal probably isn't entirely accurate or realistic. As we say, people have been under chronic stress 
for a sustained period of time. And the effects of that chronic stress don't just immediately dissipate overnight. So I would encourage folks just to have realistic expectations and probably kind of mixed emotions and experiences as things start to return to normal. I'd also encourage folks to try to give themselves a break if they notice that even as these good things are happening, um, your feelings may not have quite caught up to them just yet. I think for many people, it's almost sometimes still having a sense of waiting for the other shoe to drop, things are looking better, but is something bad going to happen in terms of another outbreak or another surge? We've been under stress for a long time. So I think giving yourself kind of the time, the space and the grace to make that adjustment in whatever way is gonna work best for you is probably one of the most realistic ways you could approach re-entry and kind of returning back to normal. Great, um, so relatedly, um, what is hypervigilance and anxious behavior is entirely dependent on the situation. I mean, behavior that years ago we would have um, quite possibly come up with clinical labels for has become absolutely essential to preserving absolutely. health. And, you know, sort of as environment is changeable and depending on who you're around and what do they, I feel the need to use air quotes, believe in as regards to there are people who are dismissive of this situation that we've gone through. I'm just curious about um, what grounding you could offer people about um, specifically related to anxiety and vigilance. How, how do you know that you're behaving in a rational way to a crazy situation? And at what point might seeking help be effective for someone? No, I think that's a really fair question because the truth is you're right. A lot of times um, hypervigilance, perhaps kind of excessive safety concerns, worry and anxiety, avoidance of things are things that might be classified as um, something that could potentially fall under some type of clinical issue like anxiety or post-traumatic stress. But the truth is, in the context of the pandemic, many of those behaviors have become the norm because in part they are being advocated and encouraged in order to protect everyone. So I think a lot of it is really considering the context. In terms of how to find that line between, you know, am I still being rational about this or have I kind of crossed the line into doing something that really may be excessive, even given the circumstances that we're continuing to live under? I think what we really need to think there is in terms of if the behaviors or the concerns are becoming excessive is, is it really starting to, cons to I'm sorry, are the behaviors starting to create some level of significant distress or impairment for you? So it's really becoming a type of thing where, yeah, I know I still need to be careful and I need to be safe, but gosh, I'm so fixated on it. It's like I can't shut down my mind. I keep worrying about it. It's distracting me. That could be a good indication that maybe things have gone a little too far. Same way with behaviors. Everyone, and this is going to depend on everybody's individual safety, situation with their own health and comorbid medical issues and with their various social experiences, whether it be work, school, family, or friends, people need to be able to do what's going to make them feel safe, but also be able to kind of watch that balance between wanting to ensure that you aren't really isolating and keeping yourself out of things to a degree that that isolation and withdrawal is impacting you in negative ways, especially if now there is the possibility possibility of engaging in some of these things in a safe manner. Megan, resulting from COVID-19, many communities are also dealing with loss and grief. So mm -hmm. when you put together loss and grief, and then you, you think about the compassion fatigue, having to work and all of these things, what first steps might you, or recommendations might you give an individual who who has this compounding issue of loss and grief? Yeah, so the loss and grief is very real. And I think the one thing that we've seen over the course of the pandemic is the pandemic has kind of introduced various types of loss that maybe people weren't always necessarily familiar with in terms of many people think of loss as a 
loss of a loved one, a loss of a job, a loss of a relationship. But the pandemic has really introduced issues such as um, anticipated losses. Gee, we know as a result of the social restrictions, there isn't going to be the family vacation or there isn't going to be the wedding that was planned. It also introduced the idea of what we call kind of ambiguous or living losses. So these are the losses that don't really have a clear end in sight, but are ongoing. And all of these, um, all of those types of losses can absolutely result in grief reactions. And the grief that people experience with those various types of losses is all very real and valid. Um, anticipatory grief around not being able to host that graduation party that you were hoping to host is just as real to that person as the grief somebody may experience over losing a job. So I think part of it is just being realistic in terms of understanding and kind of normalizing that these grief reactions were very real. People sustained very real losses and a range of losses over the course of the pandemic. And some people may still be sustained some of those ongoing losses that where things have not necessarily been able to right themselves. So I think just kind of being aware of that and understanding that those reactions are valid and real. We do you know that in general with grief, trying to avoid the feelings and really kind of skip over the grief process usually doesn't work. That usually just results in more negative outcomes down the line. Social support is highly, highly recommended when dealing with grief in terms of being able to talk to people about those feelings and those experiences. For individuals who maybe feel a lot depending on the loss, the grief has reached a point that it really is becoming disruptive for you or overwhelming. Psychotherapy is one of the kind of top and best indicated treatments for grief. And so that's something else that could certainly be considered. We have just three minutes left, and I want to give you a, a last question before inviting um, any final comments from you. Uh, the pressure that the pandemic has put people under has made what was difficult already even harder. We know this across the board, and we definitely have people on this call that are in leadership organizations of not-for-profits where the work that's done is, is hard, even yeah. on the happiest, easiest day. So, you know, for our staff, we can't control the traumatic experiences that they came, they came to us with. We can't always have a whole lot of influence on what they will actually encounter from the clients in the course of the day. I just would like to ask you to expand as you can on, as a leader, as a manager, what can we offer our teams um, to be protective and supportive so that they make it through this particularly challenging season as best they possibly can? Certainly. No, I think truly one of the most critical things is just really ensuring that the staff or employees um, have the self-awareness and knowledge to understand how these various stressors, be it from the pandemic or the nature of the work that they regularly do, how these various stressors may impact them, help normalize that and validate them for them so they don't have the added stress of kind of beating up on themselves for feeling a certain way or not behaving in the way that they wish. I think really highlighting any type of wellness resources. So whether it be, again, learning some adaptive coping strategies, whether it be hooking them up with various online resources or webinars that can help provide some of this information and provide skills, that can be really helpful in terms of just self-help tools and self-help resources that individuals can utilize. And again, and this is a little hard to suggest because I'm not in entirely clear on what's possible within the various organizations or programs that we're discussing. But, you know, anybody who has eyeballed anything about the mental health impact of this pandemic, I'm sure has heard about the pending mental health pandemic that people are concerned is coming our way. And so I do think part of it is trying to lay the groundwork in terms of really educating people and encouraging people to seek professional assistance if it could be helpful. Um, we really, really need to remove the stigma from mental health. And if there was ever a time to do it, it was in the course of the global pandemic where most everyone has been impacted and most everyone's mental health has been impacted in some way. So I would encourage that as well. Megan, thank you for an excellent, excellent workshop. That's thank my you. sentiment, Janice, as well as our audience. 
And also, as we get ready to leave, we're at the uh, at one thirty. Would you give us parting words for our audience? Certainly. So I just want to say, um, and I, you know, I don't. I was thinking about this the other day when this pandemic started. I think the very first open classroom we did on the mental health impact of the pandemic was maybe like June, May or June. I don't remember the exact date, but I just want to say it's really wonderful being here um, almost a year later and um, still seeing so many people interested and invested in their health, whether it be mental health or physical health. Um, it's just great to know that people are still willing to invest their time and, and energy into spending an hour with us and are still interested in learning these techniques. Um, it's a great indication that you um, have not been completely burnt out by the course of this pandemic, by the very fact that you are here today and asking questions and wanting to learn about resources. So I think that's a really wonderful sign. Again, I would just encourage folks, you know, things are shifting, things are looking better, but it's not going to be flipping a switch. So give yourself the space and time that you need to make this adjustment. And that is very much how I would view these coming months is an adjustment and transition period period of coming out of some long-term and significant chronic stress. And as always, certainly hope that this was helpful to you, hope that it was hopeful as well, and hope that you will consider joining us again in the future. Megan, thank you so much uh, for this. Really wise words to leave us with, and I, I just so appreciate the opportunity to process this with you, um, you know, through the lens of your expertise. So thank you for spending the time gathering these thoughts and sharing. Cynthia, thank you so much for co-hosting and helping to moderate to our audience. Thank you so much for your participation, um, your generosity, your kindness to us and each other. We greatly appreciate it. And we hope we'll see you back very soon at another open classroom. Have a great day. Go Cardinals. Thank you everyone. <laughs>